The Thirteen Clocks by James Thurber, illustrated by Mark Simon. Chapter One. Once upon a time, in a gloomy castle on a lonely hill, where there were thirteen clocks that wouldn't go, there lived a cold, aggressive duke and his niece, the princess Seralinda. She was warm in every wind and weather, but he was always cold. His hands were as cold as his smile, and almost as cold as his heart. He wore gloves when he was asleep, and he wore gloves when he was awake, which made it difficult for him to pick up pins or coins, or the kernels of nuts, or tear the wings from nightingales. He was six feet four and forty-six, and even colder than he thought he was. One eye wore a velvet patch; the other glittered through a monocle, which made half his body seem closer to you than the other half. He had lost one eye when he was twelve. For he was fond of peering into nests and lairs in search of birds and animals to maul. One afternoon, a mother shrike had mauled him first. His nights were spent in evil dreams, and his days were given to wicked schemes. Wickedly scheming, he would limp and cackle through the cold corridors of the castle, planning new impossible feats for the suitors of Seralinda to perform. He did not wish to give her hand in marriage, since her hand was the only warm hand in the castle. Even the hands of his watch and the hands of all the thirteen clocks were frozen. They had all frozen at the same time on a snowy night seven years before, and after that it was always ten minutes to five in the castle. Travelers and mariners would look up at the gloomy castle on the lonely hill and say, "Time lies frozen there. It's always then. It's never now." The cold duke was afraid of now, for now had warmth and urgency, and then. Is dead and buried. Now might bring a certain knight of gay and shining courage, but no, the cold duke muttered, the prince will break himself against a new and awful labor, a place too high to reach, a thing too far to find, a burden too high to reach, a thing too far to find, a burden too heavy to lift. The duke was afraid of now, but he tampered with the clocks to see if they would go. Out of a strange perversity, praying that they wouldn't. Tinkers and tinkerers and a few wizards who happened by tried to start the clocks with tools or magic words, or by shaking them and cursing, but nothing whirred or ticked. The clocks were dead, and in the end, brooding on it, the duke decided he had murdered time, slain it with his sword, and wiped its bloody blade upon its beard, and left it there, and left it lying there. Bleeding hours and minutes, its springs uncoiled and sprawling, its pendulum disintegrating, the duke limped because his legs were of different heights. Sorry, his legs were of different lengths. The right one had outgrown the left because, when he was young, he had spent his mornings place kicking pups and punting kittens. He would say to a suitor, "What is the difference in the length of my legs?" And if the youth replied, "Why." One is shorter than the other. The duke would run him through with the sword he carried in his sword cane and feed him to the geese. The suitor was supposed to say, "Why, one is longer than the other." Many a prince had been run through for naming the wrong difference. Others had been slain for offenses equally trivial, trampling the duke's camel、uh, camellias. Failing to praise his wines, staring too long at his gloves, or gazing too long at his niece, those who survived his scorn and sword were given incredible labors to perform in order to win his niece's hand, the only warm hand in the castle, where time had frozen to death at ten minutes to five one snowy night. They were told to cut a slice of moon, or change the ocean into wine. They were to set. They were set to finding things that never were and building things that could not be. They came and tried. And failed, and disappeared, and never came again. And some, as I have said, were slain for using names that start with X, or dropping spoons, or wearing rings, or speaking disrespectfully of sin. The castle and the duke grew colder, and Seralinda, as a princess will, even in a place where time lies frozen, became a little older, but only a little older. She was nearly twenty-one the day a prince, disguised as a minstrel, came singing at the town that lay below the castle. He called himself Zingu, which was not his name, and dangerous since the name began with X, and still does. 
He was, quite properly, a thing of shreds and patches, a ragged minstrel, singing for pennies and the love of singing. Zingu, as he had so rashly called himself, was the youngest son of a powerful king, but he had grown weary of rich attire and banquets and tournaments and the available princesses of his own realm, and yearned to find in a far land the maiden of his dreams, singing as he went, learning the life of the lowly and possibly slaying a dragon here or there. At the sign of the Silver Swan in the town below the castle where taverners, travelers, tale-tellers, toss-pots, troublemakers, and other townspeople were gathered, he heard of Sarah Linda, loveliest princess on all the thousand islands of the ocean seas. If you can turn the rain to silver, she's yours, a traveler leered. If you can slay the thorny boar of Boythorn, she's yours, grinned a traveler. But there is no thorny boar of Borithorn, which makes it hard. What makes it even harder is her uncle's scorn and sword, sneered a tale teller. She will slit, he will slit you from your guggle to your zatch. The duke is seven feet nine inches tall and only twenty-eight years old or in his prime, a tosspot gurgled. His hand is cold enough to stop a clock, and strong enough to choke a bull, and swift enough to catch the wind. He breaks up minstrels in his soup like crackers. Our minstrel here will warm the old man's heart with song, and dazzle him with jewels and gold, a troublemaker simper simpered. He'll trample on the duke's camellia, spill his wine, and blunt his sword, and say his name begins with X, and in the end the duke will say... Take Sarah Linda, with my blessing, O lordly prince of rags and tags, O rider of the sun. The troublemaker weighed eighteen stone, but the minstrel picked him up and tossed him in the air and caught him and then set him down again. Then he paid his due and left the swan. I've seen that youth before, the traveler mused, staring after Zingu. But he was neither ragamuffin then nor minstrel. Now, let me see, where was it? In his soup. The tosspot said, like crackers. <laughs>